Welcome to the Full Disclosure Podcast. Today we're diving deep in the markets because there's a lot going on that you need to know. But really what's on my mind today is the recent gold price surge. And I've got to take why we're seeing this surge that's different than most conventional wisdom. I also want to discuss my overall view on gold and how I view gold relative to stocks. And we've got a few other big stories in between. We're not just scratching the surface here, folks. We're uncovering the big financial stories because let's be real, knowing the real deal is where the power is. Folks, here we go. If you have concerns about your financial future, let's be honest, the world shapes your wallet. We're taking you behind the scenes to look at what's really happening in the real world. Inform, prepare, and empower. This is the Full Disclosure Podcast with your host, John McGregor. Before we dive in, don't forget to hit subscribe below. We'd love to get your thoughts in the comments section below. Also, as a reminder to everybody, I recently put together a free document titled The Ultimate Guide to Wealth and Retirement. And this white paper is the culmination of 28 years of me working with thousands of individuals of all walks of life. It's really my best financial and retirement practices that I've accumulated showing what you need to do to build and sustain wealth before and during retirement. It's been extremely pop- popular and it's free on my website at johnmacgregor.net, johnmacgregor.net. So check it out. Oh, and also I get into my proven cash flow and wealth building strategy. And you've heard me say this a million times before. It's the exact same strategy my 93-year-old father, soon to be 94, has used and still uses today to generate fifteen dollars to $20,000 per month as a hobby. And he's been doing it for the past 13 years. And I use it as well to generate thousands of dollars per month also. All right, so with that, let's get into it. And I want to start with a market update because we really haven't talked about the markets in a while because although the market was up 24% last year, it was a huge year despite all the craziness that happened. The market was up 24% last year. It's continued its climb this year, making its best, really its best first quarter that we've seen since 2019. And frankly, I believe the market still has ways to go, especially given that we're in this political cycle. And I think the Fed is going to do everything they can to keep the stock market climbing as best possible. But I will say it's not going to be a straight line up. We're going to see some volatility, especially in the near near term, given what I'm seeing with the economic indicators that I'm seeing, which we'll get into, which also relates to gold, these gold prices surging. And you've heard me say this before. I think the Fed is very political. And although Jerome Powell, who runs the Fed, his term is up in 2026, it's pretty pretty safe to say he'd like to keep his job until then, which means he needs to keep his boss, Joe Biden, in power. So despite the inflationary signals that we're seeing, which we'll talk about, which would normally mean the Fed would be raising rates to tame inflation, Powell, in my opinion, is going to do everything he can to lower rates to prop this economy up from now until the election. That's my opinion, and he's going to do this to keep these markets up artificially, and more on that in just a moment. So on that note, you probably have heard the buzz around the magnificent seven stocks, which these seven stocks have basically been responsible for a big portion of the overall market's rise last year. Just these seven out of the 500 that comprise within the the S&P 500, these seven stocks have contributed to a majority of the performance for the entire basket of those five Hundred stocks. In fact, if you look at last year, those seven stocks alone combined for an average return of over 70%. And the remaining 493 stocks on average, they returned just 6%. I mean, that's a massive disparity. But the Magnificent Seven is really starting to look more like the Fabulous Four. And things are starting to quiet down with a couple of those seven stocks. But there's actually a silver lining in that story. And it's pretty wild because remember, I mentioned earlier, the S&P 500 had had its best opening quarter since 2019, jumping up by about 10%. But two of those Magnificent Seven, namely Apple and Tesla, didn't have the best time. Apple shares have taken a hit, an 11% hit this year, and Tesla, Tesla's down 30% year to date. And I, I can see Tesla going down even further from here. Alphabet, or in other words, Google, same thing, had a, bit of, had a bit of a rocky start, but managed to pull off an 8% gain after a late surge. 
So it's interesting, while those, those three had their struggles, the rest of the big tech crew of those Magnificent Seven, that would be NVIDIA, Meta Platforms, in other words, formerly known as Facebook, Microsoft and Amazon, they've been on fire, earning themselves the nickname, the new Fabulous Four. And they've been out doing the broader market and some folks are seeing this as a good sign. It means that the market's growth isn't just riding on Apple and Tesla's shoulders. Others, other sectors, are stepping up too. And almost all of the S&P 500 sectors, apart from real estate, which is the exception, saw gains with smaller companies, industrial companies, financial services, insurance companies leading the charge. And, and really, I see this diversity is really fueling this optimism that the market has more room to grow, especially with this economy seemingly to dodge a deep recession. Now, I didn't say recession, I said deep recession because we could still see a recession. And the Fed, which despite all of, the, all of these inflationary signals, will be possibly cutting interest rates soon. At least that's what they're saying right now. We'll see about that. Now, don't call me a skeptic here, but maybe the strategy for the Fed will be that Powell doesn't actually cut rates, at least in the short term, but he continues to say that he will because this is important. What Powell says publicly, in many cases, has just as much of an impact on the stock market than what he actually does. So in my opinion, what he may do is just kind of dangle this carrot of lowering rates up until the election while not lowering them at all. But on the upside, we do have a lot of excitement going on in the markets right now, especially around artificial intelligence that's really adding a lot of enthusiasm. And to me, this enthusiasm is way different than the dot-com area, because I hear a lot of people you know, comparing the two, that, that artificial intelligence and the stocks that are in the businesses that are using AI and the run-up in their stocks is just the same as, as the dot-com era back in the early 2000s. I don't think so at all, because these companies within the AI space, most of them, I should say, actually, they actually have a product they sell, right? <laughs> they have a track record. They have earnings. They have sales. They have a business, unlike the dot-com area where those but those companies were just ideas with a dot com after their names. And this AI phenomenon is way, way different than the dot com area. Now, NVIDIA is stealing the spotlight thanks to a huge demand for AI computing power with its shares skyrocketing. And it's been a great stock to own. And now the most significant holding. Let me repeat that. And now NVIDIA is the most significant holding for most individual investors. Meta or Facebook is also soaring thanks to its AI investments making ads smarter, and it's even paying out its, its first shareholder dividend. Microsoft has overtaken Apple as the biggest US company, and then you have Amazon's profit, profitability or earnings is looking better than ever. So here's what's crazy. It's that despite their recent price surges, some of these stocks that are at these all-time price highs are actually looking less expensive from an earnings standpoint than they ever did last year. So for example, NVIDIA trading at a lower price to earnings ratio compared to its peak last May, despite the huge run-up in its stock. And there's talk about investors possibly moving away from these big tech stocks into other sectors as the year goes on, especially if the earnings of those other companies in the index start outshining them. Because remember, earnings drive stock prices. So when you're looking for stocks, what you're looking for is a company that's growing its earnings or profits over time. And we can see a lot of these other companies outside of the tech sector, outside of the Magnificent Seven, growing their earnings. So it seems to me it's a huge positive. It's a hot positive sign that the market's holding up even without the full backing of those tech giants. But, but, huge but, it's important we just don't focus on the stock market because there is a darker story that most people are dealing with. And this is where I want to shift gears and really look at the other side of the coin, which is what's happening in the real world for so many people. And despite the fact that we've had this nice run up in the stock market and we continue to do so this year, and I believe we will, over time this year, frankly, it's really not helping individuals survive on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And you may be feeling this pinch as well. As I hear from so many people, frankly, around the world, whether they're contacting me through the, through the podcast or directly my website, 
people are really freaked out about what's going on, particularly with inflation, job losses, etc. So, have you caught the wind of the latest shocker? Fox News dropped this bombshell most recently. And they said, nowadays, to afford a home that's priced in the middle of the market, Americans now need to rake in at least $110,000 per year. I mean, can you believe that? $110,000 now in income is needed to buy the average price home. And this is going around the world, folks, not just in the U.S. Back in 2020, only three years ago, you only needed $74,000 for the average price of a home. That's a massive leap. And honestly, it's pretty wild. And frankly, that's really due to two things. Number one, we have interest rates up huge as as a result of the rising inflation due to all this borrowing, money printing, and of course, government spending, which also resulted in number two, which is a 32% rise in the average home cost. Now, let's be be clear here. I want to make a distinction. That $110,000 salary is just to be able to buy an average home, which is now around $412,000. $412,000 is about the average price of a home today in the U.S. Three years ago, the average home price was $322,000, about a $90,000 gain in just three years. But here's the real stat that speaks to what's really happening. Yahoo Finance came out and said, home ownership is more and more out of reach as they say the average American needs to earn more than 80% And get this, 80% in order to comfortably afford a home in today's market. A huge difference than just being able to buy because they look at it a little bit differently because they add in all the other costs associated with owning the home due to all these higher prices, including higher prices of utilities, insurance, which has gone through the roof, maintenance, appliances, furniture, et cetera, all those things that you need to live comfortably. So it's one thing to just be able to buy a home. It's another thing to be able to buy a home and live comfortably. And that's what Yahoo Finance was pointing out. And with rent well over 20%, and in some places rent's over 50%, and now we find 50% of Americans can't even afford to buy a home. I mean, what are people to do now? And this whole situation is putting a huge strain, strain pretty much on everyone. But it's hitting some folks harder than others. I mean, just take seniors, for instance. I mean, they're really feeling feeling the pinch because their expenses are going up thanks to inflation, of course, but they're stuck with fixed incomes, right? They're living off a pension if they have one, Social Security, and that's it. They're not working, so they're not growing their income, and they're stuck with these higher prices. And let's not even get started on the younger crowd, those first-time home buyers. I mean, just imagine being all hyped up to buy your first home, dreaming of starting a family, and then bam! you're hit with the reality of soaring home prices and interest rates under the current administration that are through the roof. For a lot of them, owning a home today is turning into a distant dream, sadly. And speaking of interest rates, younger people, especially those in their 20s and 30s, they're really in for a rude awakening. They've been living in this bubble where inflation wasn't really a big thing. They didn't really care about it. Now they're finding out the hard way that interest rates really have skyrocketed. And what used to be affordable at 2.5% for a mortgage is now out of reach because rates have jumped to 7% and maybe going even higher based on my forecast. And this change, frankly, is making, it's making it tough for many to move up the property ladder or even get in it in the first place, right? And sadly, today, so many people are focused on so many issues that have no relevance on their long-term financial survival. They're focused in the wrong areas, worried about all of these social issues, particularly young people who are so animated over these issues, because one day they're going to leave the comforts of their parents' home or their insulated college campus, and they're going to wake up to this massive reality when they're going to have to find a good paying job in this difficult market. They're going to have to start paying their own bills, renting or buying a place to live. Here's a novel thought. They're going to have to start paying taxes, paying for insurance maybe one day raising a family. And here's the real talk. This situation is affecting real people's lives. And here's more proof that more and more people are struggling. And here's an article from the USA Today that I found. Really eye-opening. It's titled, Pawn Shops Know Something About the U.S. Economy That Biden Does It. Times are tough, unquote. 
This article is all about pawn shops. And I'll just summarize the article. It starts with a discussion about Biden's been a bit, he's been on this big mission lately trying to convince us that the economy is just roaring, right? You may have heard him say this. He's pointing to stuff like inflation slowing down, which we know is nonsense. More jobs are popping up, which isn't true. Wages are going up, which is somewhat true, but still way behind inflation. So it's really not helping that wages are creeping up. And he also says super low employment, which is really due to a lot of people still not working. And you just do the math on unemployment of people working versus not working. When less people are working, the denominator drops. Therefore, it makes unemployment look even better. So that whole thing is nonsense. But the article goes on to admit that not everyone's feeling this economic sunshine Biden's trying to gaslight, it with, gaslight us with, which, which is really what he's doing. After two rough years of high inflation, a lot of working families, especially those living paycheck to paycheck, which is, a, which is over 70%, are really feeling the squeeze. And there's this, this interesting tidbit in the article. It's, it's, the, it's the focus of the article. The two biggest pawn shop chains in the U.S., which own about 1,700 pawn shops between them, are seeing more and more people coming in to the pawn shops. And they're getting more and more of their own stuff pawned, and more and more people are asking for short-term loans. More so than they have ever seen before, which clearly shows a level of desperation. Even gold, the article states, which usually people invest and keep to protect against inflation, is being pawned off more as folks from all walks of life are trying to get some extra cash in order to survive. So folks, when you hear pawn shop businesses are booming, it's not good. That's not a good indication of what's to come in the future. And so what this leads me to is our next story, which is all about California. And I kind of teased this two, two weeks ago. And they did it, folks. And not surprisingly, California Governor Gavin Newsom strikes again with his version of Gavinomics. <laughs> Here we go. California raised their minimum wage from $16 per hour to $20 per hour for fast food workers, making California the highest minimum wage in the United States. And get this recently, the price of a Big Mac meal at a McDonald's location in a wealthy town in Connecticut hit $18. And I'm telling you, it won't be long before a Big Mac alone costs $18 or more just in California. And this raise isn't for the workers in the local diner or a retail store at a shopping mall. No, this is just for fast food workers. These cost increases are so sharp that even the McDonald's CEO, Chris Kempsinski, said on the recent company's earnings call in February, that McDonald's is having a harder time pulling in lower income customers and middle class customers aren't far behind because of these new higher prices. Oh, and by the way, as I mentioned before, that $20 minimum wage excludes Panera Bread. We talked about this two weeks ago, which is a massive chain throughout California, which by the way, is a fast food restaurant. But because the owner of these 130 Panera Bread franchises is a very good friend and major campaign contributor to Gavin Newsom, Panera Bread is excluded from this $20 minimum wage. I mean, that's unbelievable. Why? Well, the end around scam is that Panera Bread, quote, bakes their own bread. That's right. They bake their own bread. That's how they spun it. That's how Panera Bread escaped this. That's how Gavin Newsom bailed out his good buddy because they bake their own bread. In fact, it was the other night, my father-in-law had a great idea and he suggested that McDonald's and Burger King and others should just bake their own bread, right? Problem solved. <laughs> but there's no way that's gonna work unless they start con contributing a lot of money to Gavin's campaign. But do you, do you see folks how this system works here? And with ground beef prices up 6% year over year, which is double the rate of our current inflation, I mean, the outcome is so predictable. This will just crush the lower and middle income class because they won't be able to afford to eat there anymore, or rarely. I mean, going forward, it will be a treat to go to McDonald's. I mean, how crazy is that? And we've talked about this before. And these are just some economic realities. Folks, when you hear inflation has been tamed or is coming down, that does not mean that prices are coming down. It just means that prices are going up slower. And it's so important you understand that 
So you're not conned by the media. And to use this example, a real life example, I was just in the grocery store the other day and I was looking to buy a stick of deodorant, Old Spice deodorant, it's my favorite. And it used to cost me less than $4 or right around $4. And today it's up to $8.38 a stick of deodorant. So when they say inflation is coming down, using this example of the stick of deodorant, that does not mean that stick of deodorant is, to, is gonna go down from $8.38 to $8. No, it's gonna continue to rise from $8.38, but it's just gonna rise at a slower rate and will continue to rise approaching probably $9 or higher in the future. That's the scam the media doesn't want you to know. And also, when you hear labor costs are going up by 25% as a result of this minimum wage increase, these policies, this doesn't mean the corporations are going to have to eat this cost or sacrifice prof profitability. What they will simply do is raise prices to compensate for the increased labor costs, or they're going to shrink the labor force or make it even more efficient with automation to, to keep the expenses in check. I mean, it's just pure economics, folks. And I did some homework on this, and it's fascinating because I wanted to verify my thoughts on this. And, and when, you, when you look at just any study done over the years on the effect of raising the minimum wage, these studies will show you that for every 10% increase in the minimum wage, that will reduce employment by 2%. Let me repeat that. For every 10% in the minimum wage increase, that will reduce employment by 2%. And also research clearly shows us that minimum wage does not re reduce poverty. Again, the increase of minimum wage does not reduce poverty. And the job loss effect to the lower and middle cl income class and the increased prices on their wallets only makes things worse. But anyway, as expected, as a result of this 25% increase on labor costs to fast food restaurants in California, here come the layoffs and they came fast. And here comes the automation within the fast food restaurants requiring less and less workers. And of course, here comes the rising prices on the food that they sell. The National Owners Association of McDonald's franchise, franchisees previously estimated California's mandated fast food wage increases will cost each outlet $250,000 per year. Each outlet, $250,000 per year. And when you ask me, John, who does this help? Frankly, the answer is no one. And I'll get to this motivation in a moment. But in reality, it really helps no one other than Gavin Newsom's political hopes in the future. So here we go with early layoff announcements. Pizza Hut, first one out of the gate. They've already announced they've cut 1,200 pizza delivery jobs. Roundtable Pizza, another huge franchise is cutting close to 1,300 pizza delivery jobs. Jack in the Box, testing auto fryers, uh, automatic drink dispensers, which will eliminate even more jobs. Excalibur, which is another pizza franchise, is looking to eliminate 20% of its workforce. El Pollo Loco will be, out, um, will be automating salsa making, and the list goes on and on. And in overall, California alone, there are 726,000 fast food workers and 30,000 restaurants. And some of these will go completely bankrupt, which means... More layoffs for everyone, including the managers as well. And also, you got to think about all the ancillary jobs, other than those that work directly in the restaurant. I mean, you have food and other necessity suppliers, the people who deliver the meat, the soda, the paper cups, the napkins, the cleaning supplies, the maintenance workers. I mean, how will they be affected and how many jobs will be lost there? And the spin is on this legislation says that they're just trying to help people. It's just a benevolent act of kindness, right? You know, in other words, we're here from the government and we're here to help, right? Well, how is this going to help people when they lose their job, right? I mean, you have to wonder if these questions are even asked before they implement. And I think they are. I mean, they're just taking a, a political risk that they think will play out in their favor down the road. And by the way, I mean, let me ask you this. At $20 an hour, I mean, if that's really going to help people, why don't we make it $50 an hour? How about $100 an hour? Because if $20 is going to help some people, what do you think we could do with $100 an hour? I mean, that's going to help a lot of people. Why not? Let's make it $100 an hour. I mean, let's do it and see what happens. 
It's just amazing that they continue to implement these financially destructive policies, and not just in California, but everywhere. Especially when you consider California already has the second highest unemployment unemployment rate in the United States at 5.2%, which is more than 25% higher than the national average of 3.9%. California is already facing a record $68 billion deficit, which is only getting worse as more and more people and businesses are leaving California to other states. California has the highest tax rate than any other state in the U.S., and they continue to double down on these policies. And the governor... The Governor Newsom continues to tout the health of the economy, but stats show job growth slowed to only 0.87% last year, which is the worst rate in the nation and its worst worst growth rate in 30 years. And by the way, if you think California is the only state that will adopt this increased minimum wage, I think you're living in a cocoon. Once California adopts this and these other blue states see this, this is going to be a sweeping trend across the U.S. So the question you're probably asking is... John, what's all this about? And you look at the bigger picture. What's the bigger motivation? What's the bigger incentive? And it's all about power and control. The bottom line, in my opinion, is that Gavin is running for president, potentially this year if Biden doesn't make it, which is quite possible. If not this year, he's definitely running in 2028. And he knows, he knows this. His state is in total disarray, not just economically, but with homelessness, crime, debt, prices, etc. But he also knows that no matter how much destruction he causes in California, I mean, he could burn this place to the ground and the people in California will still vote for him no matter what. He will win California no matter what happens in the state. And I also think that he can turn around and blame all the greedy corporations and, and those evil rich people for all these problems especially for laying off these employees as a result of this minimum wage increase and simply pass the blame onto them saying, look how evil they are for laying people off. So not only would that be a huge political talking point across the country as he runs for president either this year or four years from now, so would his message of how he raised the minimum wage to help so many struggling people. And for most people, those who are not informed and certainly those who do not watch this show, They will completely fall for that nonsense and they will completely miss what's really going on in the real world. And this is why financial education, um, political and economic education is so, so vitally important for your future and the future of this country and the world, frankly. All right, so let's get to the last story and let's move on to gold. Lots, lots happening there, as you probably know. And I know there's a lot of listeners that are very interested in gold as I am, especially right now, as gold can be an incredible hedge against inflation. Now, candidly, I am not a big investor in gold. I own gold, but I'm not a huge big investor in gold as others are. And I will show you why in just a moment. It's just my opinion. But I do think everyone should have at least 10% of their portfolio in a broad basket of precious metals. That includes gold and and silver. But if you've seen the trend in gold over the last several weeks, if not the last several months, it's just been going up, 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 and now we're at an all-time high. And it's important to look at these things as an overall investor because it can give you great clues into where the economy may be headed and how how you may may be able to take advantage of these indicators rather than investing blindly, as most people sadly do. And by the way, people ask me this all the time. You know, John, what's your crystal ball in the economy? And I will tell you, there are no crystal balls or silver bullets to invest in, but there are indicators that can give you some clues and how to make money no matter what's going on in the marketplace. And the price of gold and other commodities is definitely, definitely one of those things to put in your crystal ball. So it's interesting. This is what's really interesting about gold. You know, last Sunday, gold was up about $30 at one point, just one day. And that was happening in Asia. And it hit well. It was like twenty two fifty an ounce. Maybe it hit twenty two sixty or somewhere close to that. What's crazy about that? There was no major event, no catastrophe, no market sell off, no banking disaster that would have driven up gold from an economic standpoint. Right? We saw about a three percent rise in just over a couple of days. It was an incredible run. But here's what's so crazy about that: is that no one mentioned it. I mean, literally, no one in the mainstream media talked about it. And then I was listening to a podcast by Peter Schiff, 
And it was funny. He said the same thing. He said, pointing out to CNBC, which is one of the leading financial channels, right? They completely ignored the story. It's almost as if, it's almost as if they purposely ignored it because it doesn't fulfill their narrative of what's going on behind the scenes and how what's really happening with the economy is not something that they really want to report on. It's like, it's almost to me like they wanted to bury the lead because CNBC and others, they love to tout the stock market, which is why they're pushing for Powell to lower interest rates. When, as I said earlier, when in reality, that's the last thing Paul, Powell should be doing right now or in the near term future, because contrary to what CNBC wants you to think, as I've talked about, inflation is not going down. It's going back up. And I think gold is the canary in that coal mine that's telling us that, which is why gold is rising significantly and very quickly without any major catastrophic events that are occurring that would normally have caused that type of rise in gold. I hope you're following me with this on that. Now, granted, a lot of people point out that the central banks around the world are buying up enormous amounts of gold, which is driving the gold price higher. And then you have the BRICS nations, right? That's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and roughly 25 other countries and counting that are in talks together about creating their own currency backed by gold to replace the US dollar as the world currency. So between the central banks buying up gold around the world, which they are most definitely doing, and the BRICS nations, a lot of people believe that's the sole reason gold prices are rising. And I would agree that probably has an impact, maybe a big impact on the price of gold, perhaps significant. No one really knows to what extent, but I believe this rapid price increase recently has more to do with a hedge against impending inflation than it does against those previous two things I mentioned. So I think, I think of gold rising, it could be a sign that many investors have really underestimated the risk that inflation poses to stocks. And I will also add to Bitcoin. And I think Really, this may be a wake-up call to a lot of investors that thought Powell will be lowering rates three times this year. Now, as I said earlier, I think he's going to try to figure out a way to do that one way or the other, either by doing it or just saying he's going to do it. But I do think this rise in gold prices is a clear indication that no matter what Powell does, inflation is not going down. In fact, inflation is going up. I mean, just look at the commodity index that we talked about two weeks ago. Overall commodities, which include all of the agricultural components, the metals and the oil we use to create products that we use and consume, which are really the lifeblood of our economy, they're up way over 13% this year and rising. I mean, that's big. That's a huge inflation in indicator. We now see oil surging and the dollar rising, which are all inflationary signals. And if this is the case, it could very well be bearish on the stock market and the bond market overall. Now, hence I say overall because there are always pockets that do well in a rising interest rate environment. So for example, financial companies benefit from higher rates because of increased profit margins. Insurance companies, brokerage firms generally benefit from higher interest rates. Obviously companies that are in the commodity space like agriculture, oil and gas, natural gas, those do well in rising inflationary and hence rising interest rate environments. And lastly, just your idle cash parked in a money market fund or in a CD or in a savings account, short-term treasuries pay higher interest rates as well as money market funds, and they're very liquid. So that's always good for your cash positions. And my point here that I'm trying to make is that no matter what's going on in the marketplace, which is why you listen to this show and others, right? Is because you can find opportunities no matter what's going on while staying away from areas that are subject to a decline, especially in this environment where I see rising inflation continuing to go up. So although gold is rising fairly quickly, I would caution you in jumping head first out of the fear of missing out. In other words, out of the fear of FOMO, fear of missing out, because that's what happens so often. When the price of something is at an all-time high, that's when everyone wants to jump in. So just be very, very careful with the price of gold at this level. Do I think it can go higher? Yes, absolutely. But just be very careful when gold is at this kind of level's um, because it's very likely we can see a pullback, which would be a good buying opportunity. So with all that said, as I wrap up, I do want to take a moment and share with you the differences between owning stocks and gold and why my overall preference is to buy stocks. And this is just my opinion. And I would love your feedback and your comments below. And let me be clear, 
It's not one or the other. It's not between gold or stocks. Diversification of your assets is absolutely critical. But if I had to pick one or the other, I would choose stocks every single day. But for right now, let's just focus on gold for a moment. Look, we all know gold is in the investment world is like a roller coaster. And there's a lot of debate about why owning gold is good or bad, right? And right now it's in the spotlight because of its price at an all-time high. But you have people like Warren Buffett, who basically says owning gold is like is, is like basically owning a useless chunk of metal. It just sits there. It's not really used for anything other than jewelry, and it doesn't pay a dividend. And that's why more and more people have preferred buying businesses, which is the Buffett method, than simply owning gold on its own. And his method is to invest in companies that grow and produce products and services that people need that have strong track records. And you really can't say that about gold. Look, I will say, of course, gold has been the age-old symbol of wealth and security, right? And it still is today. It's not just the luster that people love, but it's the scarcity, the durability, and the fact that it doesn't corrode, making it a very superior store of value. And also, it's a great insurance policy and a hedge, particularly a hedge against inflation that we're seeing today. But when you bring stocks into the picture, which was the new way to represent ownership in a company going way back to the 1600s, but it wasn't really until the 19th and 20th centuries that the stock market as we know it began to take shape. Stocks offered something gold couldn't, and it was a share in the growth of businesses. And as the Industrial Revolution accelerated, those who invested in successful companies saw their wealth grow exponentially. Now, when we talk performance of gold versus stocks, historically, and you cannot deny it, stocks have outperformed gold over the long term, and let me explain why. First, you have economic growth. Stocks give investors a slice of a company's future profits as the company grows, so do corporate earnings, generally leading to higher stock prices. Gold, however, doesn't produce income or dividends. In other words, it doesn't produce cash flow. Gold is really an insurance policy. Its value is largely based on really investor sentiment of the economy, demand, which as we discussed can be influenced by things like inflation and geopolitical uncertainty. Number two with stocks, you have innovation and productivity. Companies can innovate, improve efficiency, and expand into new markets. Take, for example, healthcare technology, the internet, and now AI. And this ability to adapt and grow means that over time, successful companies can increase their value significantly. Gold being just a physical asset doesn't really have this capability. Third, you have dividends. Many stocks pay dividends, providing an income stream to investors in, di in addition to potential price appreciation. Gold doesn't offer this benefit. And as I teach, you can use simple option strategies to generate income instantly on stocks you own and on stocks you don't own. And then lastly, with stocks, you have liquidity and market depth. The stock market offers vast liquidity and depth, making it easier for investors to enter and exit positions very, very quickly. While gold is also liquid, the stock market's daily trading volume dwarfs that of gold, the gold market. Now, having said all of that, despite stock's superior performance, gold has never lost its luster. Absolutely not. It's seen as a safe haven during times of economic uncertainty, a hedge against inflation, and a diversification tool. And when the stock market tumbles, investors often flock to gold, pushing its prices up higher. So I'll end with this. Look, the bottom line, and to recap, while stocks have historically outperformed gold, both definitely have a place in an investor's portfolio. Stocks offer potential for higher returns through economic growth and corporate innovation, but they come with higher volatility and risk. Gold, on the other hand, offers stability and a hedge against inflation, making it a valuable diversification asset. So whether you're dazzled in gold or you love the idea of owning growing businesses, you have to understand that both can provide a balanced perspective on wealth and investing. After all, in the world of investing, diversification is the name of the game, and there's room for both, the allure of gold and the dynamic potential of stocks. So with that, I would love, love to hear what you think on that, on that debate. I'd love to hear about the other stories, about the minimum wage, um, as well as the other stories that we talked about, um, the overall market. 
um, and, and so forth. And uh, I love your feedback because it really helps frame future shows because we want to make this the most informative show out there so that you can take this knowledge and then you can use it to your own advantage and your family's advantage. So let's leave it there. And I hope you enjoyed the show and I hope you got something out of this. Again, please send this out to other people that you know could benefit from this, this financial education, because as I always say, knowledge is power. Hit subscribe and we will see you next week. Take care and aloha. Thanks for listening and supporting Full Disclosure. If you like this episode, remember to like and subscribe and follow Full Disclosure. To make a better financial plan for your future, join our Cashflow Bootcamp, where John shows you a safe and smart way to turn your investments into a steady income stream in a fraction of your time. Learn to make money in any market. Until next time. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.